Lord Jesus, we ask you to really minister to us tonight in this class and that we would be quickened, interested, encouraged, thoughtful, and wise, and that your love would teach us to help people. We're here just to learn something so we can help people and give good advice and direction. We ask it in Christ's name. We pray, amen. Uh, do you remember I asked you in the last two classes, how would you counsel Cain? Do you remember that? Okay. How would you counsel Cain? So I'm going to teach for five minutes, and then you're going to talk with your neighbor. So kind of look at your neighbor, the right or left, see if they're acceptable or not. <laughs> kind of locate, see, you know, is it going to work? Is it going to, do I have a dud? Am I sitting next to... Like, who's going to teach us? <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, it'll be great. All right. Um, how do I counsel Cain? One point that we've made in, the, uh, in our teaching is our um, theology. Let me get the right pen here. Theology. How important is our theology in counseling? Very, right? I think, um, okay. I wonder if I've got the right, yeah, there we go. How important is our theology? Hey, Justin. Welcome, Justin, back. Really, <clears throat> kill the fatted calf. Get the rope. Okay. He's back. Good to have you. Our theology. How do I understand uh, Cain? Cain has got some deep problems from a theological point of view. Remember? And could you somehow describe, understand Cain from a biblical viewpoint? Um, and we talked a little bit about that and also made mention that in the book of Jude, he's really listed with two others. What were the names of the two others? Very good. Well, ch chapter, the only, the only chapter in Jude, verse 11, Cain, Korah, and Balaam. Okay. Theology is important. Number two, the counselor. We have spoken a little bit about the counselor. How do you? How are you prepared? How are you prepared to give counsel? All right. What is in your life so you can be a counselor? What are those things in your life? How do you live so you can be a counselor? Yeah. What are the disciplines that you have in your life so that you can be a counselor? What makes up a counselor? Okay. In short, it's to walk with God, be wise, to be experienced, um, to have a, a theological viewpoint, that is correct, to be in, led and guided by the Spirit of God. So those two points, the color, don't pay any attention to the font or the color in that because it's not meant to mean anything. It was a mistake in how I did it. Okay, uh, so now, um, okay, so now, uh, how would you counsel, how would you counsel David? David was a believer, and we read the story, 2 Samuel 12. <clears throat> okay, so turn there with me, please. 2 Samuel 
chapter 12. In chapter 11, you read the sin of David, the uh, adultery and the scheming to cover it up. And he really did a good job in one way. The problem was that uh, it didn't please God. Look at the last verse of chapter 11. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. No one had really found out about it, but God saw it, and it displeased the Lord. Then the counselor, Nathan, in chapter 12, confronts David and speaks to him. And he does not cover it up, but he, he tells a parable. He brings light into the situation. David admits it. David repents, and, um, and he goes on in his life and in his walk with God. It may be that he lived in his sin for nine months during the pregnancy, the birth of the baby, and then the baby died, and, um, and then and Nathan spoke to him, and he repented. So we have a relatively long period of time when David was in his carnal state of mind, in his um, problem, in his, uh, his deceitful nature, his old sin nature. So what I want you to do, I'm, I'm not sure how well you know the story and how, what you can say about it, but as an exercise just now, I'd like you to speak about how important is the theology when you counsel David, your theology, and then number two, um, your own personal life as a counselor. Okay. Those two elements in counseling, biblical counseling. So the first one, how would you counsel David? The first point is the theology that you have, how you look at David, what you think about him, what you know about David, God's mind on David. Um, how important is your theology, your mindset as a counselor? And then number two, your personal life as a counselor. How are you prepared to be a counselor? Okay, so um, go ahead, do that. Talk to your, make little notes if you like, may write down a few points and then talk to your neighbor about it and I'll ask you a few questions. Okay, are we good? All right. When, when you are counseling somebody, how important is your theology? Okay, why is that? Why is the theolo theology important? To know God's mind. Because uh, there's three people. There's the counselor, the counselee, and there's God. And this is another level than just two people talking. This is the Holy Spirit is ministering to both people. The Holy Spirit is caring about, about David. Well, the Holy Spirit is not happy with David. David has sinned and lived in it, and there, there's a dead man because of David. A man is dead now. A family is destroyed, um, and, and David is responsible. How, much, how, do, how, how important is our theology when we, are, when we are counseling and leading and guiding people? 
but it is fundamentally important because it's through the truth that people find restoration. There's a real deep ministry that happens in the hearts of people if we are thinking with God. And this thinking with God is important. And so the counselor, the, the second point there, the counselor cannot just be any person like off the street, even though out of the mouths of babes in Psalm 8, God has shown his strength. And sometimes the young one has the mind of Christ, Job 32. But sometimes people talk and they are not, uh, they're, God is not happy with all the talking that is happening. How do we know that biblically? Where is that in the scripture? Yeah, Job 13, 3. And at the end of Job, God is saying, pray for these three friends of yours uh, because God is not happy with their counsel. And if you, if you read Job, you see that their counsel was too superficial, misrepresenting the mind of God. The best counselor in the Bible is Jesus Christ. And the reason why he is the best is because his theology is, is his mindset. And so he has the mind, the mind that is able to minister to people on a very deep and personal level. And of course, because of his character and his nature as a counselor, he was uh, perceptive and capable. Let's look at a couple points. Uh, turn, I'm, I'm gonna give you a chance to uh, answer some questions, but first of all, look at 1 Thessalonians 5 with me. And we see a, um, <clears throat> a uh, outline for the believer in the church, the believer in the church. Now remember that the, the problem with man is this uh, fallen nature and out of his heart are these things that, that cause him constantly trouble. Mark 7, uh, 21 to 23, we have a list. Fornication, adultery, lying, thievery, witchcraft, and evil eye, pride, these come out of the heart of man, the heart of man that is uh, fallen. From the heart comes a mindset, and I draw it like this, like a box, so that you have the heart and then you have the mind. And we have a mindset, patterns and thoughts, um, mindsets, the, uh, the complexes of thought patterns that constitute how I look at myself. There's really, there's at least three directions. You look at yourself, um, you look at others, and you look at God. More could be said about it, but I think that's, you can say the past and the future. And in your mind, you look at yourself a certain way when you have a fallen sin nature. All right, I don't want to go too fast, and I don't want the class to be too yeah, I, I want the whole, we, of course, we prayed that the Holy Spirit would lead us in our class tonight and make it clear, but the mindset of people, it's like awesome when we read in our Bible that there are certain, um, there are certain mindsets and that God points out um, that are rooted in my, my heart 
that is fallen. So my heart, my fallen condition, has has um, precipitated in my mind, really through these words, these emotional words, guilt and shame and fear. And I have built in my, I have in my mind uh, patterns of thoughts that are rooted in these, in these words, in my, in my way of thinking about myself, about others, and regarding God. It's like amazing how that is and the way it works. So... Um, um, we can make a short list of those mindsets. Um, one of them is, is self-righteousness. This is in Romans 10, 2 and 3. And Second Corinthians eleven thirteen to fifteen. Cain Cain had this mindset. He was self righteous. He was therefore also judgmental. Uh, he didn't know how wrong he was. That's the thing about the fallen nature of man. When man is wrong with God, he doesn't know this. Uh, he is deceived. He doesn't realize it. He is uh, a lot more wrong than he realizes, but he defends himself and protects himself. Another mindset in, in the Bible is the um, Galatians 5. Um, it's a... Uh, in the, along in this, this portion, it's biting and devouring, biting and devouring one another mindset of hurting people, biting and devouring, and um, it is based on uh, legalism. And that is why churches that are legalistic have a hard time existing and also for there to be peace and contentment, satisfaction, love, and joy. But people are, are, are easily um, hurting each other and because there is, not, there is a mindset rooted in the fallen nature of man and that the uh, reasons are, are many, actually. There's another one, and it is... Uh, Complaining, and this is in First Corinthians ten. Murmuring is the word that people are not satisfied. Or complaining as a way of life, it's a mindset. They're not thankful, and that because of the the mind has developed a way of. Um, digesting the world around them, looking at life through their fallen nature. So this, this highlights the point of our theology, our Bible knowledge, and our way of looking at man. And um, it's, it's important that the counselor would realize that many problems that people have are rooted in a spiritual cause. And it's their, their old man, their old sin nature, their fallen nature. So um, in 1 Thessalonians 5, we see that the church is an important part of the healing that happens when a person is born again, they are given a new heart, and now their mind is renewed. So you have a heart without a hole in it, and you have the mind, and this is the 
mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 and verses 14 to 16. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you. It, it's uh, beautiful to think that we allow this. We are worshiping, relating to God. We'll go through a list of um, disciplines that a counselor has in order to have an impact in his ministry as a counselor. Well, first, let's look at this uh, portion and recognize that um, there are people amongst us and they are called uh, to, to walk in the body and receive a ministry. So, chapter 5 and verse 12. <clears throat> verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Okay, we, we are together in our new heart, in, and then we, we understand the value of edification and divine communication that affects our hearts and our minds. Verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Have you ever heard of that phrase, over you in the Lord? There are people that are over me in the Lord. Isn't that amazing? I love that. I, I want that. People over me in the Lord. And uh, I want to know who they are and those that labor and are uh, admonishing you, in verse 12. Admonishing is a deep kind of encouragement. It, it has the, my, the meaning of being corrected. 2 Corinthians 7, in verse 10, we see a series of words there on what godly sorrow does to people. There's two kinds of sorrows. There's godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. What does worldly sorrow do? Worldly sorrow. What? I can't hear you. I can't. I don't, what, is that in English? The man's name Esau? He, he saw, he, he saw, he saw what? Is that a Swedish or is that, no, Esau, okay. All right, a godly, sor worldly sorrow is, is, uh, it works sorrow, but not hope. It buries you. It condemns you. Like Eula said by mentioning Esau, Esau became bitter and his sorrow, his depression, and he became uh, very sad. But what does godly sorrow do? It changes your life. Godly sorrow is good. I love it. I mean, actually, isn't it? Like if you are really broken, you really feel bad, but you, at the, in that feeling, you feel God is speaking to you. Listen, this is wrong. I am with you. I am changing you. You follow me. Never do that again. You are out of the woods. I am God. And the man is saying, like, deeply in his heart, I'm sorry. Like, I, I really, I agree. I'm, that thing is... I'm dealing with that in my heart. This is godly sorrow. That's a great principle. I hope you know it. Do you know that? How many of you know it? Like, you, you know it? Okay, we, we'll look at it right now. Turn to 2 Samuel 7. It's a whole class, actually, on this, but um, we're going to just touch on it. Verse 10. 
Godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Like, you don't have to apologize for it. You know, I do feel that some people should leave church and they should be feeling very sorry. That some people should go to out of church feeling like to, in their heart, like very much, we say, convicted or very much moved. Like, I feel that we don't only go out of church always with a lot of joy. We do that, but on a certain Sunday or Wednesday or class time, it could be a different kind. But it says in verse 10, but the sorrow of the world works death. Right? So who had that in our New Testament? Judas Iscariot. He was very sorry. It says that in Matthew 27. Judas was sorry, he repented, but it didn't change his life. By the way, tears are not the evidence of repentance, but a changed life is the evidence of repentance, right? Because you have tears, Judas had tears, and he was very sorry, but why was he sorry? He got caught, he was on the wrong side of the, in the game. He was ashamed. He was, his life unraveled. He was disappointed. He played the gambling game and he thought to get out, get 30 pieces of silver and I'll get out of this thing and I'll be good. These guys, these foolish people can go their way. But then it, it hit him like he's, he's ashamed. He's uh, made a bad move. He's uh, sorry he did it. But what happened? His sorrow did not, was not godly sorrow, it was worldly sorrow. Right? Godly sorrow does this, verse 11. And what do we have? Seven words, I think, here. For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. What does that mean? It's like this guy is like changed. He goes, yeah, you know, it's like, man, I hate that thing. I hate that thing. I'm not there. I hate it. God has changed me. You see that? This is a beautiful kind of sorrow. You see, people, we sometimes get the idea, you know, sorrow is bad, but it isn't if it's the right kind. It's the very kind you want because it will work in you a real change. And that's, a, that's an amazing uh, work of God's grace in our lives. And... Um, um, we've seen that happen. And maybe it has happened in your life. You know, that's awesome. It's holiness, it's conviction. You know, it's God's work. Wow, praise the Lord. That's amazing. Okay, go back now, please, to 1 Thessalonians 5. We haven't gotten to our, our portion here yet. Does anybody have a question about godly sorrow, worldly sorrow? Second Corinthians seven eleven. Second Corinthians seven verses ten and eleven. Okay. Chapter five. Any question or comment about it? Godly sorrow, worldly sorrow. Okay. Mindset. The mindset of a carnal man is, um, is produces a lot of problems and troubles in people's lives. And they have in these mindsets a need to be challenged because 
as believers, we, we have been gifted with the Holy Spirit. So counseling um, that is really rooted in the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is the counselor, and that is why uh, the counselor, the man or the woman who is the counselor, must be filled with the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, to walk in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> here are a couple, um, a list that I have here. What are the disciplines for the counselor? I won't write them down, but I'll, I'll read them to you. Number one, he is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prays for that. He wants the Holy Spirit to fill him speak to him and lead him in his life. He is a man of faith walking in the spirit. Number two, he reads the word personally. He looks for God's word in the word. He looks for what God is saying to him, that God is his counselor and he's learning the word. Number three, he applies the word to his life. He memorizes the word. If you can, but you meditate on it, that's important. But if you memorize the Bible, you will find yourself meditating on the Bible. If you memorize it, and it's really a lot of work to memorize, but if you memorize, you'll find yourself meditating. And then, of course, you apply it. Colossians 3, verse 16. Number four, the counselor is a man or woman of prayer. Galatians 4, 2, 1 Timothy 5, 17. He is a person that Luke 18, he prays, and he really believes God, God answers his prayer. God walks with him. He lives in prayer. He asks God to help him and give him understanding. Number five, he is in a local church. The counselor is fed in the local church. He has body life in the local church. He listens to other people. He gets and receives from other people God's mind. He's a man that is receiving counsel himself. If a counselor isn't receiving in the local assembly, then we can't be sure. I mean, really, in a sense, is he hearing from God? Like, if I am submitted, and I know those that are over me in the Lord, over me in the Lord, then I am um, being equipped by God as a counselor. Number six, he is a worshiper. He is, because of being a worshiper, he's lighthearted, thankful, uh, rejoices, as Christ's mind. Number seven, he has theological understanding. He understands these things when he's talking to David, how he will counsel David, what, how he will lead David, affect David, and guide David out of his uh, sin, the effect of the sin, the condemnation. Number eight, he has the right goal in his counseling. That is the maturity of the believer. And then number nine, he is a student studying people. He studies people. He listens to them, watches them, learns from people. Wow, beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. 
read about people, think about people, study people, listen to people, be a student of people. Then another category for the counselor, how does, what are his relationships with other people? If a counselor is of God, I'd like to know what are his relationships with other people? Is he evangelize people? Does he, does he disciple people? Does he serve people? What is his uh, family life like? What is his marriage like? Does he know he has, this is the last point, does he know he has a potential for sin? Does the counselor know that he can sin? That's under the theological understanding category, I would assume. But I'm amazed. I mean, I think it happens that sometimes when you're doing well as a believer, you think you stand, but that's the very time when you may fall, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. How could a counselor fall in love with a counselee and scandalize the church, his ministry as a counselor, and also the name of Christ. But the counselor may have failed to understand his potential to do that. Do you have the potential to do that? We all do. We all have that potential. And what, why wasn't there some safeguards or there is some, some way of preventing that to happen in the counselor's mind. Uh, but maybe because the way he learned it wasn't including that potential for sin and the organization that he's accountable to, that, that would, would at least help prevent that from happening. How many of you, this is a side point, but I think it's relevant. How many of you have ever heard of the Modisto Manifesto? Okay. Yeah, Modisto, California. Modisto Manifesto. It's interesting. It only takes me a minute to explain it. Billy Graham became very uh, effective in evangelism in the 1946 or 47, sometime like that, in California. And at the end of the crusade, which lasted for a couple months, he got his staff together and he said, what are the things that the public says about uh, evangelists in the United States? And they said, uh, number one, the evangelist runs off with women. Number two, they're doing it for money. Number three, um, they um, lie about the numbers of people, the numbers of people that come to the Crusades. They misrepresent, they exaggerate the numbers. So Billy Graham in his team said, we don't want this to be the way we are. We aren't that way and let's make an agreement together that we'll have, when we collect money, we'll have an association that's responsible for the money and it to be audited and accounted for. We'll have policies and we'll do it, everything out straight, out right, right and clean. Number two, with women, we will never be with a woman alone who is not our wife. We'll not be in a room alone, we'll not go anywhere alone will not be in a restaurant alone with a woman that is not our wife. And then number three, we will use the police numbers for the number of people that come to our meetings. The police will give the record, the number, and that's the number we'll use. Uh, he went by these rules, the organization did, and, and Billy Graham organization has kept itself uh, clean in the eyes of people, and because it is that way. And I, we have to applaud him for doing this. 
Well, in counseling, it's uh, also the counselor needs to realize uh, what his potential is for sin. When you have a weak, uh, uh, there was a 15-year-old girl in Hammond, Indiana, with the pastor counseling her, and he ran off with her, and it was a tragic thing for the church and what the church went through and so on. And that was Jack Hiles' replacement. And, you know, that church wasn't used to that type of thing at all. Uh, but potential means that I have margins. I guard myself with margins. Um, even though the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, what happens in your heart, that's your business. That's between you and God. But you can't act out what is in your heart when it is sinful. When, when, you cannot act in it. And, of course, better is that you find yourself uh, spirit-filled and doctrinally sound. As I said in that list, you have the doctrine, the word, the edification, you have the body, and you have the accountability. So we say you, you, when you're a counselor, you don't do it alone. I mean, you'd, you'd be behind, behind a closed door or in a room alone, and um, um, it's maybe you would even have somebody with you, unless it's to be more confidential, and uh, you might also want a team counsel, and also um, you're just simply wise. You just are wise. That's, that's that. Okay, so we haven't read it yet. 1 Thessalonians 5, we're still working our way. Okay. Uh, verse um, 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Can anybody give me an example of somebody unruly? What does that mean? Unruly. Warn them that are unruly. What is that? What is it? Diotrephes? The Diotrephes, okay. Uh, yeah, he was warned. He was warned. That's true. That's true. Um, what's that? <laughs> yeah, they need to be warned. Warn them that are unruly. And then we have... Comfort the feeble-minded, the small-souled, support the weak, Romans 15, 1, and be patient toward all men. There needs to be, uh, Robin? Okay. Uh, is, did... She said, what if you warn somebody unruly? You see, in the church, there has to be divine order. And in the church, there has to be, if it is, if it is unruly, if it is out of order, then people need to be submitted to the authority and become listeners, be spirit-filled and spirit-led. This is a problem with people now just not... Just what you said, Romans 8, when somebody is in the flesh, it bothers you, right? Okay, it bothers you, okay? It bothers you. So what do you do? You are in the flesh back to them, okay? 
this is what you have to avoid. You cannot be in the flesh when another person is in the flesh. And this is why you ask the question. When, you are, when, when somebody is unruly, you warn them or you want to correct them, but then they're the same way back to you. And it provokes you. And you want to, you want to take their head off or throw them out, okay? You, you, you have to, we, we have to learn um, that we cannot be carnally minded. This is the meaning here, carnally. If we, to be carnally minded is death. It's for a Christian, is death, okay? There are people that can't sleep at night. Uh, because of things that happen, and it happens to everybody, but it's amazing how carnally minded Christians can be. They, they, are, they can be very petty. They can be very controlling. They can be very reactionary. And this because um, they simply are not uh, capable. They are... They are not spirit-filled. They are judgmental. They are critical. They are unhappy, personally unhappy. And then they want everything to go right. And when it doesn't, there is an amazing reaction. Uh, we speak, spoke recently about responding to God instead of reacting horizontally. Responding to God, having God's mind, and, and maybe somebody else dealing with it. Like you are a pastor's wife. You could be in a situation where it just uh, bugs you. There are things that will bug you in the church. You know, so the, the dishes in the church, the, the fellowship hall are not done. There's cake on the floor. I'm not saying this about you, but I'm just trying to explain. The nursery is untidy. Um, nobody's controlling their children. And it's like a circus, and you're there filled with reactions about everything. And uh, the church shouldn't be in that, that state, but how does it become a orderly, clean environment for people to learn and to grow in the faith? And it has to be handled a certain way. So you're right. If somebody is unruly and you are there, and they, they just react back to you. Especially parents with children, it's amazing how, you know, like if a child is running wild and you ask the parent to take care of your child, they, they go, they go, they're very angry about it. They're very reactionary about it, you know. That's my child, leave my child alone, you know. I came to church not to be in an argument with you, and, and so on. So this is all church life. But I just say um, we can work these things out by foresight, by instruction, by, by leading people, but not by reaction and not by anger. Get out of it if you're just finding yourself just constantly angry with people. Just get, take a break from it and back off and let, let other people handle it because you just cannot be... Uh, uh, fighting with people. It just doesn't bring, uh, you know, the peace that needs to be in the church to do the deeper thing, and that is to instruct people in the Word of God. I don't know if that helps you. I'm not, you know, I'm just using what you said to make a general statement. Okay, so do we see here different kinds of counselees, unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil. This is the general condition of the church. Rejoice a lot, verse 16. Pray without ceasing, in verse 17. And everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Quench not the spirit. This is the anointing. This is the place of the Holy Spirit giving us divine counsel and training our minds to think in a new way, to receive the 
doctrine that is able to transform my life. This is awesome. The embracing the doctrine that changes us, 617. And we'll look at that. Romans 12 through 2 and 3, transforming our mind. A counselor is a body member who is discipling people. And when he is counseling people, he's actually discipling the counselee and leading them further in their spiritual life. And one of the things that the counselor does is he gives them hope. Counselor, by the Holy Spirit, he gives hope. Let me explain that. What if a drug addict comes to me and he says, you know, I need counseling. I may direct him to Pastor Lightsey, who did a great job last week. Tonight, we're going to have Pastor Taggart talk about financial counseling. That'll be at the end of our class, the last half hour. Financial counseling. I guess I'm not going to be here. No, I'm going to be. I'm joking. I'm going to be. Have, you know, how to counsel people with regards to handling money. And it'll be fun to hear what he has to say about that. The counselor, listen, the drug addict comes to me, he wants counseling. What is it that I want for him? When he leaves my office, is he going to be healed of his addiction? He might not be. Maybe, I hope he would be, but he may not be. But what is he going to leave with? Hope. I hope so. He's going to go away thinking, maybe this is good. Maybe I have a chance. Maybe this is, I kind of feel encouraged. These people are giving me a message. I have a future. It is possible. My life could change. I actually am beginning to think I want it to change. That's amazing. Okay. Um, so you can... Plug in there any number of cases where you just think, maybe I won't give the answer in one way, but the answer will come in another way, and it'll be a message of hope. Um, remember in Exodus 16, when Moses took the, the tree, and the water was salty, and, and he prayed, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it in the water, and then they could drink it. Uh, maybe what I ask for isn't what God will give me. He'll give me something else that will bring about a good um, resolution or solution to the problem. Okay. All right, so before we finish, um, before the break, um, I asked you, how would you counsel David, and how important is your theology in counseling him? And then number two, how important is the counselor and when you counsel David? Okay. Have you thought about it? You did? Do a little review. Talk to your neighbor. When we counsel David... How important is the theology regarding David's heart? What would I tell him about his heart? Um, what happened? You committed adultery. What would I tell him about God? What would I tell him about God's grace? What would I tell David about his future? How would I counsel him? And how those things that I would say theologically how are they in my life, in my heart, in my way of thinking, in my mindset? Okay. So first, the theology, and then, okay, so take a few minutes and think about it and talk about it. <clears throat> okay, how are we doing? Anybody want to volunteer? 
how important is the theology when we counsel David? Why is David, why is David different from Cain? He's a believer. Does David have the equipment, the capability of receiving from God? Yes, he does. So that's important. Where would a, where, so the counselor needs to have his, his message, his ministry. Now, I'm not talking about the story where as Nathan is the prophet, afraid of David and going with the parable. I'm not talking about that. We know what the text says, and I appreciate it, and that's another message that's important. But we're talking about, about the mindset of the counselor when, when he talks to David. So go ahead. Yes, Kim. Okay. <laughs> Tap it. Okay. Uh, I think the battery's dead. Is it? Is it? Is there a person there, Sebastian? Is it? Go ahead. Just he'll he'll deal with this. But can you talk anyway? Okay, not, not law, but give grace, the message of grace. What else? Yes. Uh, as far as a counselor goes, like um, a counselor can't give wisdom that he hasn't already applied to his own life. Okay. Uh, counselor can't give out wisdom that he hasn't also always or also experienced in his own life. Um, what about, where did, your, where did David's sin come from? From his heart, right? And, and would, wouldn't that be appropriate to counsel David and to explain to him how did this happen? Where you can tell me, David, how this happened. It came from your heart. The temptation came from your heart. And why is that? Why, why would it come from what happened? But because man is a sinner, then he sins. And the answer for the sin is Christ. Christ gives grace, forgives us, and we are restored. Um, what else would you say to him? Yes. I think David must have known in his heart that something wasn't right because he's a spiritual believer and he was actually <coughs> so you must, you could ask. Um, Pastor Simon, the part about um, there could be a shallow approach to David's problem, like a shallow approach, like you're a good guy, this won't happen again, or, or you know, you're it's okay, or what kind of shallow? Did you did you want to say something about that? 
Ouais. Euh, David was in a position that he could receive, he could receive truth. He could receive the fact that Nathan hit him head on. Because he knew what was right and wrong, and because he knew of grace and mercy, he could receive truth with absolutely no, no issues and no condemnation, as you would see a few chapters later when the, when the child died. Before that, he'd been praying and fasting. After that, he just washed himself, anointed his head with oil, and just continued his life as if nothing had really happened. So he knew, he knew God. He knew the tree. He knew what was right. He knew the mercy. And so he could receive everything that was given to him that was given in truth. Mm -hmm. It seems to me like the theology is the message. That's the message, the theology. It's almost like David's personal life. Yes, he sinned. Yes, he has uh, displeased God and he's hurt people. But the message is, David, uh, there is a God in heaven who cares for you. There is God, and he is a God of all grace. And David, I'm serious about it, we can put it on the table. Like, it depends on if the counselee wants to make a confession with all the details. It might be helpful for him, and as a counselor, uh, you would decide whether that would be needful. It may not be. But what, I'm, what we're getting at here is that, that the theology is bringing the depth, and it's the depth that is the healing. You can always talk about, oh, you're a good guy, or that was a mistake, or you know, it's too bad this happened, and hold their hand like em empathy and sympathy and understanding, but still it's not, it's not the message that a believer is built for. The believer is built for head-on accountability, confession, admission, I have sinned. And you know, this is important in life that believers would learn to admit that they're wrong. And at many times I find they blame others so easily and they just have a very hard time saying, I have sinned. And I need uh, the real message that's going to address me personally. And this can happen with, with the counselor if he is living this way. If he gets the message of Christ for his own life, then he's able to lead others in it, in some measure. Okay, any, Michael, Colby. So how do you develop that in people? Like maybe that's like for another time, but how do you develop that in yourself and then also, you know, for the people that you were discipling? Yes, very good point. How do you develop, like, it's almost against our nature to be hit head on and to be told we're wrong. I mean, we are so defensive, and we also uh, are very awkward. I was very awkward and uncomfortable to make these admissions with another person. But the counselor is able to, like, he learns to identify. He learns to speak in biblical terms. He learns to encourage. And it might be that the walls come down but it's very possible it's not the time and the place. The person is like, stay away from me. You know, don't talk to me about this. Stay away from me. I didn't ask for this counseling appointment. I'm not interested in it. I don't want to talk about it. And so that's definitely the, the nature of hurting people and defense of people. So your question is very good, and um, let's just recognize it uh, that way, that you're very good point that that it's you can't just walk into a room and immediately a hurting person is going to unload and admit they're wrong and just be con confessing and then receiving your 
counsel and be healed and walk out of there a brand new person. Uh, but there needs to be, you know, time, process, wisdom, a lot of love, encouragement. And by the way, this is beautiful about the body of Christ. This happens in this classroom without anybody knowing about your, your life. This happens in the pulpit without anybody using your name. And this is in the body. I get, you get counsel in the body and nobody knows, and I don't know often, I don't know what I am saying and to who, Hebrews 4.12, God puts the word and is a discerner of our thoughts and intentions. I mean, sometimes people have come up to the stage after the service and they said, were you in our car tonight when we drove to the service? You know, were you with us last night in our living room when we had our argument? Do you realize everything you said was exactly what we were saying last night in our living room? You know? So there is, there is the body ministry that is a divine counsel that helps with that, Michael. Uh, also, another point. The counselor may not be eager to go after somebody and find their guilt and their fault. I, I, there may not be a... Con confrontational type of personality or person. You may not be that kind, and, um, and maybe that is, there's an appropriateness to it. On the other hand, if you really want to be helpful, it's this list of things that will help a counselor be effective. What was it? Was 9, nine 10, 11, 12 things? How many? Nine, the whole list. Didn't I add a couple more? Fifteen, what? Fifteen, okay. So, um, yeah, so we may not be eager to, uh, you know, go after, but we have to pray to see how I can really help this person. Yeah, doctor? Things that sort of been bothering me since the beginning is that typically when somebody comes to counseling, they have a problem. I mean, some sort of uh, human problem with their emotions or whatever. And uh, David didn't have that. I mean, he, uh -huh. he, he was perfectly happy with what situation he set up. Yes. So uh, as a minister of the church, let's say Nathan or whatever, his job was really to confront them directly because David wasn't suffering. He wasn't in pain. He needed to be made aware of what he was doing wrong. And as soon as he became aware that somebody knew about it, he became repentant. Yes. So, so that was a very, very good counseling method for that particular situation. But that doesn't happen very often, right? Well, I mean, not in a counseling office. I would think that most people have a problem when they come to you and you have to be gentle. Yes, with yes. Stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you for bringing that out. That's true. And um, um, I'm thinking more of, of uh, not that part of the, that, that part of the story, as I kind of said a few minutes ago, but instead, you know, when somebody is guilty of sin, they're in the church, they are guilty of sin, and even there was murder in the case. And you're right, he wasn't looking for, he wasn't looking for it, but, in, uh, but he was suffering. And, but on the, on the surface, he wasn't, but you know, he was in trouble. And um, uh, Galatians 6.1 maybe is a portion where it says, if a brother is overtaken in a fault, you that are meek, you that are spiritual, go with the spirit of meekness and restore them. Uh, so um, am, I, am I responsible to my brother uh, in the body when I'm aware of something? They have been overtaken in a fault. And you that are spiritual and in the spirit of meekness, Considering yourself, uh, go and restore them.
Okay. Uh, I, because of the time, we need to do a very quick break, do a really fast one. Pastor Taggart is here. I don't want to cut into his time. We already have. But uh, it would be good to hear Pastor Taggart give us some fine counsel in the area of finances, uh, people coming uh, for counsel, and um, we'll learn a little bit about that tonight. So take a seven-minute break. Is that good?